There's a section here on executive maturity. Yes. And one of the people that you, um, your hero in this is John Wooden, one of the great college basketball coaches of all time, UCLA, da 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 da. And he believed that you always had to be the same. All his players, don't get up, don't get down. If you do it, never show it. Never show it. The same emotion winning, the same emotion losing. I don't see that yeah. in the people who were in the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> or right. even in those kids that went crazy last weekend when they won those basketball games. So how does this one work? In fact, let's go. There's a sports. What do you think, Richard? Well, I think it's one thing for the athlete. They're playing 82 games, and they can't get two up or, or two down. And they've been, you know, after a game, after the game tonight, there'll be 30 people in the leaf dressing room, and they'll be asked the same questions over and over again, and they're tired of them. And so you see almost this monotone. It doesn't make for good television, but yes. they're kind of protecting themselves. And as part of a business team, no, you want to celebrate, you want to celebrate your success, successes. You want to get up. And, you know, when you're losing, I'll tell you, you don't want to be losing. You don't want to be down, but it does affect you. So we, I think we definitely have the ebb and flow on the business side. I can understand why the athletes have built this defense cocoon around them. Okay. What do you think? So there's, there's definitely something about consistency yes. um, on, in leadership on what can people expect from you in the wholeness of your leadership, not necessarily on winning or losing. So there's, I think there's something powerful about that. But the notion of the ups and downs of winning and losing or something going right and something not going right, people, again, I, I believe, need to feel that. Where is my leader on this? Right. What are you thinking about this? If I'm upset about something or if something's not worked right or if I know that the organization, for example, um, is reeling about something, I'm going to get up in front of them as opposed to, it's okay, let's move on. We're going to talk about it. So a little bit of that's about transparency. It's about feeling comfortable enough in your own skin yes. to be able to address those issues and say, you know, it didn't go the way we expected it to, or to addressing how, do, what, how does one move, uh, move forward. So it's, I think part of that's about building trust. It's part of, part of building um, the complexity, if you will, around consistent leadership. What, what can people expect from that individual? There's, there's some of that play in there as well. A great point. I mean, I think I just want to make one distinction that executive maturity, in my view, is not it's not robotic leadership. It's not to me. It's not the extent of wooden leadership, frankly. It's not always being even keeled and and not showing any emotion, because then you appear as a robot and you don't you're not you're not able to connect with with your uh, your team. I think. For the most part, people want to feel confident in their leaders, and it's, impo it's important to show a level of calm and composure and aplomb, right? I think that's, that's critical. There are times, however, when the best leaders are able to pound their fist on the table and say, I'm, I'm pissed off at this, or, or I'm, I'm excited about this. I think that's also an important aspect of leadership. And the real good ones do it, can turn it on and off. Yeah, exactly. Bob White, when he was head of CAW, he was on my board once, I swore Bob could throw a switch. That he right. knew exactly when he started using profanities. He knew he, he was going to intimidate the president of Ford or the president of Coca-Cola. He could turn it on and off. I, I, I actually really admired that. I'm, wow, watch. Well, he was a master at it. One, one of the things that people, that's important to remember, or was actually interesting for me to hear some, some people talk to as I interviewed them, was the notion of leadership as theater. Yes. And the more that you rise up in organizations, the more that you realize that there are a lot of eyeballs on you, especially, uh, probably especially you, Richard, and both of you being in the public eye. And there is, there is something to that. It is important to recognize that there's, um, that there's theater in leadership. John Wooden coached at a time yes. when, I think when he first won, his first, there were 16 teams in the March Madness. Yeah, right. It wasn't called March Madness. Right. And there was no bloggers, there was no websites, there wasn't an ESPN, there was none of the, cam there weren't the 25 cameras that covered the Super Bowl. So it, it, it was a different time for him. Outstanding coach, but a different time. Right. So what you're saying though, I mean, there's two ways you can think about the emotional maturity idea. One idea is um, that you want to have what I call this like a zen-like Thing. What you want to do is meditate and get a sense of centeredness and therefore you stay in a space whether things go up or down. Mm -hmm. 
And there's another sense of emotional maturity, which is to say, you have all that range of, of emotions running through you, maybe wildly, but what you want to do is get control so that you show the ones that are most productive. That, that, that's the, the most that's important the point. It's, it's what's going to have maximum effect on the team given what the situation demands. If the, to your point, if, if people need to be riled up, uh, you, it, as a leader, you need to really recognize that uh, by showing emotion, that will really get the, the emotion of the team uh, flowing. If the team will be better off by you being calm and composed and, and them seeing you uh, and being confident in your leadership, that's also important as well. Yeah. People are smart. You yes. have to also be authentic about it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, debate a little bit the theater issue. Um, I never feel like I'm performing. Yes. I don't want to feel like I'm performing. I think what, what's important is it's got to be genuine. If it's not, and you can, I think we all know leaders who, you know, who are acting the role or acting the part in the moment. So it's about being smart about what, it, what is it that you're trying to address and where do you need to move people and bring them with you and, and inspire that direction. But being authentic about it to me is absolutely critical. Otherwise, you don't have the confidence and or the trust, and people see through that. And I think that's where a lot of leaders fail. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you about another one. Uh, another one you have in here is presence, which I thought was sort of interesting, because whenever you read this, you know, you kind of scroll through all the people you knew who were leaders, <laughs> and there were some who were wonderfully leaderly. I mean, they just looked fabulous, they always were well-dressed, everything was perfect. And the, some people were, were an unmade bed. Like, they always needed a haircut, the thing was here, you know, their shoes weren't very good, their shirt was half untucked. I didn't, in the end, notice one being better than another. So you were in this food business with me, what do you think? Well, I, I think, well, take two people that I work with, Brian Clangelo and Brian Burke. They have wonderful presence. In the book, they walk in, they've got warmth, they, they're very comfortable, but there's Brian, the tie's never done up. I was at him with a speech on Saturday. He didn't even, his tie was draped over like a scarf. He, um, <laughs> he can use swear words in context. Yes. He's, the only one, he's the only one at the board meeting that can swear, and no one, it, it works with him. So that's Brian Calandre, he tells colorful stories, you're laughing. Um, you know, the secretary is breaking up as they're doing minutes of the board meeting. And then you have Brian Colangelo, you know, the international man, beautifully groomed. Some of the same traits, but they both have tremendous presence and they're 180 degrees difference. Yes. What do you think? What happens around your place, Mary Jo? You know, I, again, I think it's about, presence is also about confidence. Yes. It's, it's not necessarily about what one wears unless it's so distracting that you're going to lose the confidence in, in the way people present. But there is absolutely something about the way you engage through how you appear, through your interactions with people, through bringing that warmth to light, I think, as you, as you lead, as you walk into a room, as you're managing, uh, managing a meeting. There's no question. There are some leaders who are so absolutely charismatic. They walk in the room and everyone just turns. It doesn't matter if there's 10 other people there who are equally as successful leaders. So I think, again, you, you have to make it work for you. And a lot of that is very dependent on who you are as, as, a, as an individual. And I think to your point, I would never, no one would ever accept me in the role I'm in, but also the person I am walking into a room and swearing. First of all, I wouldn't do it. But it would just not be an acceptable way because of who I am and what I stand for and what my values are. That's yeah. not passing judgment. That's, that's a personal... There was a chapter in that book, and that ch there was a paragraph in that chapter that I really liked, and I think it was called Business Intelligence. Yes. And buried in all of that presence was this one chapter, and I've shared it in... We had a meeting of our 50 senior leaders uh, a couple months ago, and that's the one chapter that I put in the PowerPoint presentation. Because it's also having, just knowing your finances, and my challenge to the directors in the room was, you have to get better at finance to be a vice president. Vice presidents have to get better to be a senior vice president, and so on, and if they wanted my job, they had to get better even. And I just thought that whole, and it wasn't just the finances, it was just knowledge of what's going on in the industry, the trends, that business intelligence, so did you read the Globe and Mail today? Did you read the intangibles of leadership? Do you know how to read a balance sheet? 
there in that, that book that you might think is cosmetic and oh, what difference does it make what suit they wear? Buried in there, that was a real nugget paragraph. Yeah. I mean, I think that's, that's critical. And like we were just talking about, uh, presence is not just about what you, what you appear uh, like. It's, also, it's about the core confidence that you have in yourself and about the impact that you can have on other people. And, and if you're in a room and you're feeling as though you're not able to really have influence and have a seat at the table, uh, there are all different ways to actually move, move the needle on that. Sometimes it can be dress. Other times it can be increasing your business knowledge. One of the things that I sometimes work with with clients of mine is um, creating a reputation to precede you. That often presence is based on people's notion of, oh, that person did this, or that, oh, that, that's the guy that did that, right? That's what you say internally. And that's when you sit up a little straighter. And to me, uh, you know, one way to actually increase your presence is by creating a, 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 a reputation to precede you, by, by branding yourself in a certain way, mm. by doing something, one thing really, really well and focusing on that. And that way, when you walk into the room, you, the, people say, oh, oh that's, she, does, she does that, I know her. So it's a different way of, of, of increasing one's presence.